Okay, welcome everyone after the coffee break. So the second speaker of today is James Parkinson from Sydney University. And we'll be, he'll be talking about Altomata for Coxeter Groups. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, thanks very much for inviting me and um, good to see you all. Um, so when I was thinking of what to talk about, I thought I'd talk about my most recent paper and then I probably could have talked about buildings to fit in with the previous talk a bit more, but anyway, um, I'm talking about something that's pretty um, straightforward actually, which is good. Um, so probably good for an evening talk. Um, but when I was thinking about that, uh, we, I have to, it's joint work with Yuki Yao, um, who was my PhD student and now I'm doing a postdoc. So I was going to write about our, uh, talk about our most recent paper, but then um, I realized I hadn't talked about the first paper Yuki and I wrote a few years ago. So I thought I'd talk about that instead. Anyway. Uh, so it's about automata for co coxeter groups, and um, there'll be these three sections, more or less. Um, the first section, I'll just talk a little bit about, um, um, well, the whole talk is very combinatorial, and um, um, the, the first part will just be about the combinatorics of reduced words in a group, and in particular about um, automata, recognizing the language of reduced words. Um, then I'll move on and talk about uh, coxeter groups in particular. And there I'll just give a, a very brief outline of um, Brink Howlett's result um, about uh, the, the language of reduced words in a coxeter group is uh, regular. In fact, they prove that coxeter groups are automatic groups. Um, so I'll, I'll go through that quickly. And then the last section is our result, which is when the this um, automaton constructed by Bob Hallett and Bridget Brink is minimal. And that resolves a conjecture from a few years ago by Olveg, Nadu and Williams. Um, okay, so anyway, that's that's the plan. Um, ask any questions if you have them as we go. Um, if you're too shy to interject, put your, uh, put your question in the chat yeah. and I will read it out for you. Thank you, yeah, I'm good. I might miss it in the chat. So um, alert me if there is anything there. Uh, okay, so, so the Let's start more generally, just any group generated by a set S and we'll, uh, sorry, my children are making some noise in the background. Um, a group generated by a finite set S, it'll be finite all the time. And uh, the length function is just the um, minimum number of generators needed to write your element in terms of these generators. Uh, a word is called reduced. So these are all um, probably fairly well known and ideas, uh, a, a word is reduced if uh, when you multiply those generators in the group, that has, um, that's a minimal way of writing that group element. And uh, we'll write LGS for the, lang uh, the language of all reduced words. I mean, uh, all this sort of, the, the word language is really just the set of all reduced words in the group. Um, an automaton, I, I won't really give a particularly formal definition, just more of an intuitive definition that works for the setting that we're in here. Um, so it's just a directed graph, in fact. Um, it has a distinguished vertex O there, let's say. Uh, the edges of the graph are labeled by elements of um, your generators. So for example, an S1, a T arrow going out of there and so on and so forth. Uh, for each vertex and each generator, there's at most one S edge for each of the S's um, leaving from that vertex. Uh, I mean, there could be, could be lots of different um, things coming back in, could be multiple T arrows coming in, but for each generator, there's at most one um, edge leaving from that vertex labeled by that generator. Uh, and the most important one is number four, written down the bottom there. Um, that there's a path in your in this directed graph with edge labels S1, S2, S3, say, if and only if that's a reduced word in the in the group. So if you have a, an automaton recognizing the language of reduced words, it means you can just start at the at this distinguished origin node follow all the paths of various, um, well, the paths exactly give the reduced words in the group. Okay, that's, that's all on automatons. Um, I mean, there's a stupid example. There's always an automaton recognizing 
um, the language of reduced words. Um, you just take the vertex set to be the group and um, edges just um, like that, um, if and only if the length of GS is, um, well, sorry, I don't, I'm too much thinking of coxeter groups there by saying plus one. I think I should just say, um, oh no, I guess that was okay actually. Sorry, it was okay. Um, if the length adds up. Um, but of course, um, well, not of course, I mean, it, there's always this automaton, but we're really interested in finite state automatons, in fact. So a finite directed graph, which recognizes the um, language of reduced words. So of course, such something with such, such a device, uh, and it's a solution to the word problem, for example, I mean, you can um, decide if a word's reduced just by looking at that graph. So not all, not all groups have finite state automata recognizing the language of reduced words. Um, let's look at an example quickly, um, infinite dihedral group. So it turns out to be a coxeter group, which is good, and for what we'll talk about later. Um, in this group, of course, we know what the reduced words are. They're just uh, the identity, S, T, S, T, T, S, S, T, S, and so on and so forth. Just simply never put two S's next to each other or two T's next to each other. And um, well, since we know the reduced words in this case, um, it's pretty easy to construct an automaton. So we have our starting node O, an S arrow to some node, which I don't really have to give a name to, a T arrow going out that way, and then um, just keep circling around uh, S opening and T. So the, the paths starting at the origin in that vertex are exactly the reduced words in, in the group. Okay, so that's a, of course a really easy example. Um, a language, the language of uh, reduced words is called regular if there exists a finite state automaton recognizing um, that language. And just to comment for later, um, there's a, if, even if there is a, a, a finite state automaton, it doesn't have to be unique. I mean, well, in fact, there'll always be infinitely many of them in that case. For example, here, um, this bigger automaton also recognizes the language of reduced words in the, um, in the infinite dihedral group. Okay, um, but there is, in the, case, uh, in the case that the language is regular, it turns out there is a unique smallest um, automaton recognizing that language of reduced words, and I'll describe it now. Uh, okay, so let's uh, let's we'll assume that our language is regular. Um, yeah, so the main bit of machinery to define is this thing called um, the cone type of an, of an element G. So the cone type is defined as written there, but what it really means is um, in the picture. We've got uh, the identity there for the group and uh, the group element G here. But maybe you'll think of that as a directed uh, on the, in the Cayley graph, let's say, for the group. And uh, um, what the cone type is, it's all of the H's that you can put here such that G times H adds up in length. So it's the ways, uh, so in a way it's, um, all the ways of extending G, let's say. So if you are thinking in terms of the Cayley graph, the cone type means you're, you're standing at the element G in the Cayley graph, and it's the way of looking out to infinity in the, in the group. Um, so this minimal automaton is defined as follows. So its set of states is just the set of all cone types. And um, the edges in the automaton are as, as given here. Um, let, let me do an example, it might be easier to go through. Uh, so let's go back to the infinite dihedral group. Um, now it's a cone type of the identity. So all ways of extending the identity of, is of course just everything. So that's our full group. So that cone type is just everything. The cone type of S, it's everything that you can 
that increases when you multiply on the right, um, when you multiply it on the right of S. So that's uh, everything that starts with a T and, and the identity itself, of course. Um, cone type of T, that's just everything that starts with an S. They're all of the elements which, when you multiply them onto the right of T, it increases in length. But notice that there's a lot of duplication I and mean, cone types of two different group elements might be the same. And indeed, lots of them are the same. This is also the cone type of T times S. And it's also the cone type of T uh, S times T times S. So everything which ends in an S has that same cone type. And similarly, everything that ends in a T has that kind of type. So in fact, there's only three cone types in this group and the, they give, give rise to that automaton. It's exactly the one we drew earlier. We've got the cone type with the identity here. And if you unpack the definition I wrote up above, but it um, doesn't matter so much in the mid there. The cone type here of um, S will be here. The cone type of T over here. And um, et cetera, et cetera. Exactly the picture we had earlier. Um, so in, in fact, it, as soon as you know that language of reduced words is regular, it means the set of, or there's only finitely many cone types in that group. Um, a consequence. Well, well, why? Uh, because of what I'm about to say. So anyway, as an exercise, if you want to check, you understand it, um, do it for Z2 with standard generators. But th this little exercise here, um, uh, so first of all, this is what we did in one example, but this automaton, which I'm calling A0, and um, constructed using the cone types, that recognizes the language of reduced words. It's almost by definition, it's, it's pretty much a tautology when you write and um, when you unpack it. But part B is um, the, the important part in a way. It's um, if you have another automaton, so another directed graph, which recognizes the language of reduced words in your group, then there's a subjection from the vertices of that um, second automaton onto this cone type automaton. Um, and it's given in, in this way. So you, in your automaton, you look for, um, you take one of your vertice, vertices X, and you just pick any path from the start node to X and read off those edge labels and map X to the cone type of that group element. And that turns out to be well-defined and, uh, and that map is a subjection. And it's in fact a, a morphism of automatons. I mean, there's more structure going on, of course. The reason I say that, and it'll be important later on, is that um, that second part of the exercise tells you that um, if the language of reduced words in your group is regular, then this cone type automaton is the um, unique minimal automaton recognizing that language. And, and minimal means with respect to the number of states. Okay, so that's um, a quick um, discussion of automata, automatons. Automata, I think is the plural. Uh, so now, now under Coxeter groups, which is the class of groups that I, um, well, I, my, my research is with buildings and Hecker algebras and things like that. And at the heart of all of those things is a Coxeter group. So I'm also very interested in Coxeter groups in their own um, right. So I guess most people have seen Coxeter groups um, somewhere or other, but here's the definition anyway. It's just a group with a very special type of presentation. I'll always be assuming that um, the number of generators is finite and um, otherwise not much of what I'm saying makes sense. Um, and anyway, I, I imagine you've probably seen that, but I, just to give a quick example, um, the dihedral group um, generated by two reflections in R2 with the um, angle between the reflecting hyperplanes being pi on M, and um, that's a dihedral group of order 2M. It's a coxeter group. The point is S squared and T squared equaling the identity is saying that they're reflections and saying S times T to the power of M is the identity is saying that this product of two reflections is a rotation by um, whatever it is, two pi on M. So people often call Coxeter groups abstract reflection groups or use some, use some expression like that. 
Uh, it'll be important for later to talk about the coxeter graph of a coxeter group. Um, so if you think back on the definition of a coxeter group, the data that we needed to actually write that group down was just um, these orders of the products, order of S times T for each pair of generators, ST. And you encode those things in a graph um, by just setting the um, vertex set of the graph to be S and the edges of the graph. Um, well, since MST equaling two occurs a lot, um, you just, that's not, there's not an edge if MST is two, which means that S and T commute. Um, if S and, if MST equals three, so if the order of S times T is three, well, that also occurs a lot. So it's convenient to just draw an edge, but not put an edge label. And if MST is bigger than three, you actually take the time to write it above the edge. But in fact, not drawing an edge for MST equals two is important because uh, that gives rise to what's an irreducible coxeter group, um, if and only if this coxeter graph is connected. Um, if it's not connected, it's just a product, ends up being a direct product of groups. Okay, um, so that's um, some basic stuff with the coxeter groups. I just list these diagrams because I'll need them later. Um, I, but most people probably know, know these sort of things um, that, if, if the coxeter group's finite, then it's called spherical, uh, is another word for just saying a finite coxeter group. And uh, the irreducible spherical coxeter groups, a well known classification from coxeter back in 1905 or something. And it's this list of diagrams, um, of coxeter diagrams. Anyway, as I say, I'll need them later on. And I'll also need the um, affine coxeter groups. It uh, doesn't really matter what affine means, but just a bit intuitively, they're the ones that um, coxeter groups that can be realized as reflections in a Euclidean space. Um, I'll draw some examples later on, in fact, anyway. Um, the affine ones turn out to be um, these diagrams here. What you notice from both of those pictures, I guess, is that there's very few instances of MIJ or MST being bigger than um, three. There's a few fours there. There's a six here, or well, there is one infinity for A1 tilde, and there's a few fives back here, but um, you don't get much more. Uh, okay, so um, moving on, do slow me down if I am. It's very hard um, on Zoom. Uh, okay, so uh, an example of an affine coxeter group, and I'll come back to this one for a few, this will be a running example. Uh, C2 tilde has coxeter graph as I've shown there. Um, it's got three generators, the order of ST is four, the order of SU is two, and the order of TU is four. Um, it can be realized as um, reflections in these um, three hyperplanes um, those generators. And then um, to think, to, to get a geometric picture of the coxeter group, the group W is, just takes that identity triangle and moves it around, and it's simply transitive action. So you can just think of W as being the set of triangles. And there's always such a construction, something called a coxeter complex that you can, um, some simplicial complex you can build out of your coxeter group. Um, just a, some quick terminology, because again, I'll, I'll need it for later on. Um, uh, I'll often write J for a subset of the generating set of the coxeter group. And uh, in that case, W subscript J um, here is the group subgroup generated by that subset of the generators. And that they're called the par standard parabolic subgroups of W. And uh, later I'll also need to talk about um, the subgraph of the Coxeter graph, just given by um, just taking the vertices of J and ignoring all the other ones. Um, yeah, sometimes I'll call just the subset J spherical if the corresponding parabolic subgroup is a spherical group, so is a finite coxeter group. And um, if J is spherical, then I'll just comment that WJ has a unique element of longest length, and um, that's denoted little WJ. But what I'll talk about now is um, maybe slightly less um, familiar, I guess. And this is um, a discussion of why the language of reduced words in a coxeter group is regular. And this is the work of Brink and Howlett um, 
in the 90s sometime. Um, now, normally this is expressed in terms of root systems and, and I was thinking of, uh, normally I think in terms of root systems, but uh, as I came to write that down, I thought it seemed like a lot to, um, a lot of machinery to build up. So you can also express it all in terms of reflections. And so I'm going to give that a go and not mention root systems. So um, all right, let's see. So first um, we'll talk about, uh, so the reflections are just by definition, the conjugates of the generators of the Coxeter group. Um, so, I mean, the, and the, the um, generators were, of course, as I said, reflections earlier, so we're conjugating them around and we get uh, more reflections. And indeed, just scooting back to that picture, the set of reflections is literally the set of um, reflections in those, all of the, the hyperplanes in the picture there. So that's really what you think it is. Um, now, to, instead of positive and negative roots and so on, think about, um, think in terms of reflections here. Um, yeah, I'd better draw a picture for this. So these sets HR plus and HR minus, well, I'm never really going to say what HR is, but I'll draw it there anyway. It's um, in the picture, it was the, the actual hyperplanes, but then um, it's a wall in the Coxeter complex, I guess, more generally. But the point is you don't really have to know what the wall is there um, or what the hyperplane is. You more need to know that there's, a partition of the Coxeter group into two parts. For each, for each reflection, you partition the Coxeter group into two parts. There's one part which contains the identity. That's this one. The identity is always in um, HR plus. Um, because the length increases there, of course. And, uh, and for example, this, well, and that's the negative side. And um, this, element W, or if I drew it as a triangle perhaps to fit with what I was talking about earlier, and this W would be something that's in HR minus and things in the other side are in HR plus, of course. Okay, so, um, so we've got set of reflections and um, for each reflection, this partition of the Coxeter group. And the inversion set, which is also something normally written in terms of roots, um, but in terms of this language I had the previous slide, the inversion set, denoted R of W, is the set of all reflections for which W is in the negative side of that, um, that corresponding partition of W. Um, now, th the interpretation is what I've said there in the box. It's that um, this is exactly the set of, um, the set of, uh, um, set of reflections for which the corresponding hyperplanes or walls or whatever you want to call them separate uh, E from W, so it'd be all these kind of, um, so yeah, this might be one of these HRs here, and that would be the negative side and the positive side. So positive side, negative side. Remembering that the positive side is always the side which contains the identity. Um, and from that interpretation, things like, for example, the length of W is equal to the number of such of these hyperplanes, number of these, um, well, the cardinality of the inversion set, all right, yeah, so another way, if you, if you try to walk from E to W, these are exactly the, um, the walls you have to cross. Good, okay, so that's called the inversion set. Um, here's a concrete example with E and W um, drawn explicitly and the inversion set is those set of the reflections in those um, red hyperplanes that I've drawn. Right. Um, okay, again, just like uh, really, like what I said in the, right at the beginning for an arbitrary group, um, there's, a, there's again a sort of a stupid automaton uh, that you could make. Um, and that's, well, an obvious automaton, let's say. That's where you take the vertex set to just be the set of all inversion sets. I mean, the inversion sets here are in bijection with the elements of W. And w is determined by the hyperplanes which separate it from the identity. Um, so you could do the same sort of thing. It's basically the automaton where you take the vertices to be the set of all group elements and edges to be what they have to be. But in this language, it goes like this. Um, things that were, were on the right earlier swap over to the left um, with the S dump. But anyway, that's just that's something a bit superficial. Um, so the vertex set is just the set of all inversion sets and um, edges in the automaton are written as I, as I say here. But anyway, of course, W is 
presumably not a finite Coxeter group, and um, well, I'm more, gen more interested in infinite Coxeter groups, I guess, for, for this type of story. And um, so that wouldn't be a finite state automaton, and uh, that's not really the name of the game. You, you really want finite state automatons. So the, the really fantastic idea of um, Bob Howlett and Bridget Brink uh, was as follows, and it's the idea of dominance and elementary roots and elementary inversion sets. Um, and it was their, their, their aim here was to prove that Coxeter groups are automatic, um, which I didn't describe, but um, what that means, but anyway. Um, so here's the idea of dominance. Um, uh, so again, it's normally something written in terms of root systems, but anyway, in terms of reflections, it goes as follows. So you have um, reflections R and R prime, and then we'll say that R dominates R prime if and only if we have this containment of, um, of these half spaces. But what this means in a picture, it's as follows. Um, work out which one's which. Um, so here's the identity here. So that would be the plus side, minus side, plus side, minus side. Um, so this would be our HR and that's our HR prime. Um, so that's the situation where R dominates R prime. And it more intuitively, and what that means is that if you want to cross HR. Um, so if you're in, if you want to walk to an element W which lies on the negative side of HR, you have to first cross HR prime. That's that's what it means. Okay, that, that's what dominance means. And uh, the set of so-called elementary roots, or in this language, elementary reflections, is the set of all um, reflections which dominate no other reflection except for themselves, I guess, um, trivially important. But anyway, so it, it, the things which don't dominate anything else. So in a sense, they're kind of the first occurrences of, hyper, of hyperplanes in there. Parallelism is not the right word because it wouldn't be an equivalence relation anymore, but somehow two, thing, two hyperplanes being parallel, it would be the first occurrence of such a hyperplane. They're the elementary ones. And the big and um, very non-trivial non theorem of um, Bob Howlett and Bridget Brink was it, that for all finitely generated Coxeter groups, so that's where we need the, the set S to be finite, for all finitely generated Coxeter groups, the set of elementary reflections is finite. Because that's um, it's not at all obvious to prove. In examples, it, it is of course obvious. So um, for example, in our C2 tilde picture, this set of red, red uh, reflections is uh, exactly the set of um, elementary reflections. Just to sort of drill, bring, drill that home, I guess. Um, so for example, so if we put in a, another reflection here, this one of course is not uh, elementary because it dominates, um, it dominates this one here, for example. Well, not for, that's the only one that dominates. Um, okay. So we're trying to see why, um, trying to prove or sketch how um, Coxeter groups the language of reduced words is, is regular. So we have to find a finite state automaton recognizing it. And the idea is just as follows. It's really to take that um, Darm automaton from earlier where we, had we just had the inversion sets and intersect all of the inversion sets with this set of elementary reflections. And uh, so it works as follows. So um, the elementary inversion set is just intersecting the inversion set with the elementary reflections take bold, uh, bold font E to be the set of all elementary inversion sets. And because this, the set of elementary reflections is finite, the set of elementary inversion sets is finite too. And then um, it's, it's relatively straightforward now. This theorem's um, not hard compared to the, the theorem that the elementary reflections is finite is hard. This one here is pretty, is pretty easy to prove that um, this gives an automaton recognizing the language of reduced words. It doesn't really matter about the details. Um, 
of that construction. But anyway, so there is this one. So in particular, um, the language is regular, and we're going to write a subscript bh, bh for Brink Howlett, and for the automaton constructed up above. Okay, so sometimes it's called the canonical automaton for a coxeter group. Um, but I'll say something about that in a minute. So here's an example um, with our running C2 tilde example. Uh, this is what the automaton looks like. So it's not um, entirely um, straightforward. Uh, one comment, uh, these, uh, well, I've, been co I've coded things with colors, of course, for the three generators, um, but the grayed out, um, um, nodes on the outskirts of the picture, let's say, they're actually repeats, but I have drawn them this way so that I don't um, get lots of uh, overlap. So for example, this 12 down here, that really should be an arrow that goes like this. And, but if you, um, because 12 is already there in the picture somewhere else, um, cross that one out. But if you do that, then um, it's a mess. Yeah, so I'll take them off so my lovely picture isn't uh, destroyed. There we are. Uh, because that's what you get if you go through the construction of computing the the um, those eight elementary re elementary reflections that we had in the earlier example and go through all of the inversion sets. That's what you get. Um, a natural question is. Um, whether this automaton is this canonical automaton, uh, as it's called, is actually the minimal automaton. Uh, and this is sort of the reason I don't like the word canonical automaton for it, because it's not minimal um, generally. And here's, here's an example. Um, it's a bit of a spot the difference, I guess. Um, but you can see the, the differences here. Um, the brink Howlett automaton, for this case, has this extra node. Well, it's really the single node 24. Um, which is not uh, not on the right hand side. So what happens here is this this uh, algebraically constructed, let's say, automaton has one extra node than the um, minimal automaton. So the one on um, this difference that sometimes the automatons are in fact identical, and, and uh, so it is it is minimal. And sometimes the difference is quite large. Here, here the difference is just one node, but in some other types like F4 tilde, there's a few thousand extra nodes in the brink Howlett automaton to the um, minimal automaton, for example. Anyway, so the, the answer is no, um, but sometimes, I guess. <laughs> uh, for example, the infinite dihedral group, both of them um, will be will be identical. So the aim for the talk is uh, to classify um, the Coxeter systems for which these automatons are in fact um, isomorphic or for which the brink Howlett automaton is minimal. And that was motivated by, a, a, well, I'll state it later, a conjecture of um, a couple of people from a few years ago. Um, but before getting to the stating their conjecture, actually, I need to just introduce a few more a um, bit of terminology. So, um, so for each element of the Coxeter group, um, choose a reduced expression and then we'll write SUP uh, W for support. The support of W are just the set of generators which appear in that reduced expression. And it's well, well known that uh, that's a well-defined, it doesn't depend on the particular reduced expression chosen. So for example, something like STS, in the infinite dihedral group, it has support S T, S and T. So the set of it's the set of generators required to write your element. Let's say, um, and let uh, R. So remember, R was the set of all reflections. R with a subscript S P H is now the set of all um, spherically supported reflections. The reflections are, after all, elements of the Coxeter group. So choose a reduced expression for those reflections and um, take their support. And you want their support to lie in a finite parabolic subgroup of W. That's what it all is. Anyway, in terms of the root system, if you're thinking in terms of roots, you write the root out and it's just the, um, non, the, the simple roots which have a non-zero coefficient in that expression. Uh, anyway. Um, an example, 
it's actually easy to see what this spherically um, supported reflections are. They're just, in this case, anyway, I mean, you look at the vertices of the chamber E, of the triangle E, and they're all of the hyperplanes which pass through one of those vertices. So in this case, it's um, almost equal to the um, set of all, all elementary reflections, but there's one missing. I mean, this, is, this guy here is an elementary reflection, which is not a sp spherically supported reflection. Okay. So it's easy to see in general that the spherical, uh, spherically supported reflections are always a subset of the elementary reflections. But as this example shows, it could be a strict containment. Okay, so conjecture now um, of Holweg, Nadu, and Williams from 2016 um, is that was that the uh, Brinkhalet automaton was minimal is minimal if and only if um, you do have equal equality of the elementary roots with the spherically supported roots. Okay. Um, so that's what I want to talk about in the talk, uh, one in the next 20 minutes, um, just to go through and um, sketch out a bit of the proof of that, um, that fact. But we'll prove it, it we'll sort of add a third. Uh, it, it's easier to prove it if you add a third equivalent condition. So we're going to add um, yet another equivalent condition into that, which will actually make the proof um, a bit easier anyway. Um, so we're going to identify a special um, family of um, Coxeter diagrams, and they're going to play some role of excluded sub-diagrams of uh, later on. We're going to insist that we don't have these as sub-diagrams of our Coxeter group. So anyway, um, curly X is the set of all Coxeter graphs, which are either, um, they're either irreducible, um, there we go. They're either irreducible um, affine, but not of type AN tilde. So they're not uh, A1 tilde, with, um, and they're not AN tilde, which is a circuit of all threes, and by J is equal three. Um, and secondly, so e either in the first class or in the second class, the second class are so-called compact hyperbolic coxeter groups that have no infinity edge labels, nor any circuits in their coxeter graph. Um, if you don't know the compact hyperbolic Coxeter groups by heart, and the ones which have neither infinities nor circuits are, are exactly the ones that I've written down below. Um, so they've got some, I'll call them, these are the names we made up for them, um, the X3MN um, and so on and so forth, X4M and uh, X5M. For these ones are just for special classes of M, special choices of M. And then there's these three special ones down the bottom um, they're kind of the ones that when you're classifying finite Coxeter groups, they're the ones that just um, stop being finite in a way. I mean, Y4, for example, if you put that five as a four, then that's F4, and then you put it up to a five and it now becomes an infinite group. Okay, um, good. So that, 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 that set we have to be a little bit familiar with. Um, and the theorem is that uh, the following three things are equivalent, that um, oh, a not a Brinkhalet. The Brinkhalet automaton is minimal and is equivalent to the Coxeter graph of W and not having uh, a subgraph um, in our class X. And uh, that's in turn equivalent to the elementary roots being the uh, spherically supported ones. So that um, proves the conjecture. Um, I've got 15 minutes. So may, uh, uh, I think I might be able to do almost the whole proof. Um, so it's um, pretty, yeah. So for, for one implies two, uh, maybe I'll go quite quickly through this one. So here we're, um, so we're assuming that um, we're gonna argue by contrapositive. So we'll assume that we that we do have one of these um, forbidden subgraphs and show that the Brinkhalet automaton is not um, minimal. And the way to do that is actually what I've got, maybe just to jump forwards, the way to do it is really that exercise I had earlier with the surjection from any automaton surjects onto the cone type automaton. And um, that's really what we've got down here. We have to find some element for which the um, there's two 
elementary inversion sets are distinct. That means they're two distinct nodes in the brink Howard automaton, yet their cone types are the same, which means they, um, they're the same node in the, um, in the other automaton. And uh, anyway, now maybe I'll skip this, this part. So basically, it, I don't think the details are very important. For each, but for each of the elements, each of those forbidden subgraphs, you find this certain configuration of roots satisfying certain properties, and they let you demonstrate, let you exhibit something as in the red box that I drew there. So anyway, it's more, it's a bit of a case by case for all the affine diagrams, you can do it in a uniform way using the polar node. And for those um, compact hyperbolic ones, you just have to um, check it case by case. Okay, but let's do the, the nice, nice part of the proof is um, two implies three. So here um, it's a bit of a diagram chase, very similar to when you're classifying finite coxeter groups, in fact. Um, so what are we assuming here? We're assuming two, which was that uh, we have none of our um, forbidden subgraphs. And we're trying to show that um, the elementary, elementary reflections are equal to the spherically supported ones. So we'll assume for a contradiction that there is um, some uh, elementary reflection for which its support is not spherical. Subgroup generated by J is um, infinite. And we're going to look at the, so forget all of the rest of the Coxeter graph and just look now at the, at the subgraph gamma of J. So just the, um, and of course, well, well, first of all, we can assume that gamma J is, is connected for easy reasons. And um, what, so what are we in? We're in the situation where we have a, um, a, a Coxeter graph, gamma J. It contains no member of our forbidden list X by assumption. And it's also not a spherical Coxeter group. Gamma J is not a spherical graph. Okay, and we'll get a contradiction after a while. Um, the first step, which I won't go into much detail, first of all, gamma J can't have a circuit, uh, nor can it have an infinite bond. And this is by a, a lemma of Bridget Brink about how elementary roots or elementary reflections, what their supports can be. So yeah, it's not um, a hard lemma, but I won't um, go into that. But what does that say already? So we'll, we'll take on, we'll start with um, our gamma J is now, so this graph, it has no circuits or infinite bonds. So it's a tree with no infinity labels. So but we'll look at all of the labels on the edges and we'll let M be the maximum edged label in this tree. First comment is that M has to be less than or equal to six. And that's because of our excluded, um, remember we weren't allowed graphs like this. Well, they were called X3, MN, and also G2 tilde uh, forbidden. So basically, if we, if we have a label bigger than six, first of all, we, we can't just be a rank two thing because that would be a finite group and we're not allowed to be finite. So we'd have to have at least three generators and we've got something bigger than six, then you've got one of these excluded diagrams. So straight away, M has to be less than six. Um, okay, so suppose that M's five. So it's maximum edge label in this, in this tree is five. Um, and let's, um, first, let's assume that there's another edge S prime, T prime with a label M prime with M prime being either four or five. Okay, so we'll assume that there exists such a thing. And then, um, well, we can put it, um, you know, this graph is connected so we can join them up. We might have to swap the roles of S and T and S prime and T prime or something. But anyway, we've got a picture like that. But uh, we get our, get, if you remember our list of graphs, which I'm sure you don't of course, but um, if, if the distance between these two, two edges was too big, then we'll get this red circled thing. And that was X five, uh, three. That was one of these excluded things which we're, which we're not allowed to have. So that can't happen. Um, and similarly, so that distance has to be smaller between these two edges. In this case, we'll have an X five um, M prime with M prime being four or five. And that was an excluded graph. This one is X um, four of um, M prime. And that was also excluded. And this guy finally is X three of five comma M prime in the notation area. And that's excluded. So they're all uh, eliminated. So in fact, there can't be this extra node. And uh, so there's a unique 
um, node with edge label, a, a unique edge with label five and all others are less than or equal to three, so either three or two. Um, but then um, we look, these three diagrams I've drawn here, they're in our excluded list. They're not permitted as sub diagrams. So that forces in fact gamma J to be one of these two diagrams I've drawn, if you uh, just unpack it a little bit. Uh, but these two things are H3 and H4. These are finite coxeter groups. But uh, gamma, gamma J was not a spherical di diagram. Um, so that's a contradiction. Okay, so M's not five. And so we just keep going. Um, so I'll go over through the whole proof thing. Um, so if M is uh, four, well, uh, we're not allowed C N tilde diagrams, that diagram I've drawn. So that means there can't be two edge labels, um, both four. So in fact, there's only one edge label of label four, but we're not allowed B N tilde diagrams either. So that, implies there can't be a branch in the tree, otherwise there'd be a BN tilde as a sub diagram. So in fact, it's just a linear diagram, um, but it's also not allowed to be F4 tilde. And so that severely restricts the length because if it, if it was any, well, it's not allowed to have F4 tilde as a sub diagram, so it can't be very long. So it can only be one of these two things I've drawn um, below, but these things here are BN and F4 respectively, and they're finite. And that again is a contradiction. Um, so uh, it has so in this maximum edge node has to actually be a three. So that means they're all either three or two. So it's just it's got no edge labels. In fact, um, let's say because we remember we're meant to emit the edge labels if it's three. Um, but then we just go through a D four tilde is not allowed, um, and that means you can't have any vertices of degree bigger than or equal to four. Dn tilde for n larger than four now is not permitted. So that means we can't have two um, vertices in our tree of degree three. But gamma is not equal to an because an is a finite, just the, um, well, is a finite group. So that means there are, and an of course is, um, so just in case, uh, well, I guess everyone knows what an is, but an is just um, that diagram. So that means they're actually, must be at least one branch. There's at least one branch, um, no more than one branch. So there's exactly one branch, one uh, vertex of degree three. So um, in two minutes, I think I get. So um, that means that uh, this this graph has to look like this. It's uh, got one vertex of degree three, and we'll just call the lengths of the arms of that thing a, b, and c, and we'll assume. Uh, We'll, we'll put them in order like that um, without losing any generality. But then we go through this little argument here. So first of all, we're not allowed E6 tilde. That's that one there. Um, so that means A has to be um, one, because if A was bigger than or equal to two, all the other ones would be bigger than or equal to two and we'd have an E6 tilde. Um, we're not allowed E7 tilde. So that means B has to be one or two. But if B is one, then we're actually just dn, which is finite, and that's a contradiction. So in fact, b equals two. Um, so we've got a graph that looks like this. We don't know how long c is yet, but uh, if c is too big, namely bigger than or equal to five, then we get an E8 tilde, oops, sub diagram, which is forbidden um, in our, from our list. So actually it has to be one of these smaller ones but these smaller ones are all spherical diagrams. They're E8, E7, but E7, E7, and E6, respectively. Um, and so we finally have our contradiction, in fact, so um, that, that eliminates everything. And then finally, um, three back implies one that was actually proved by the uh, people who made the conjecture. Um, so we go through the proof again in the paper, of course, if you want to read it, but um, but I won't go through that here. So anyway, it's probably the first talk where I could give essentially a complete proof. So I'm quite happy with that. Um, thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you, James. That was a nice talk. Uh, do we have any questions? Yeah, maybe uh, one one question, like um, like. How how does one interpret this uh, 
equality. I mean, like uh, now this is a classification like by exclusion of sub diagrams. Um, but but is there some some more geometric interpretation of uh, of the minimality of this spring Harlot uh, automaton? Um, kind of. Um, yeah. So the well, it depends um, how geometric we go. So in in now. Yika and I wrote another paper just a few um, a month ago, so I submitted it, and, th and there we um, study a lot more this minimal automaton. And in fact, we um, study it in a different way. We group, so you've got these cone types um, for the coxeter group, mm -hmm. and we group all elements which have the same cone type. Um, well, we form a partition of W according to that um, having the same cone type. Well, in fact, the inverses of the elements having it. Anyway, you get you get a decomposition which looks very much like the decomposition into Kajdan Lustig cells. So if you're familiar with those pictures or, or more elementary, like saying that's very similar to the Xi arrangement. So in A and tilde, you get exactly the Xi arrangement. And, but that's exactly, that turns out to translate um, to, to the statement that in A and tilde, um, which has none of these forbidden sub diagrams, um, the brink howlet equals the um, the cone type automaton. So another way of saying it is that the partition, this cone type partition, which we call it, um, yeah. equals the Xi partition. And you can you can make the Xi partition for all coxeter groups. Um, and in the Affine case, you take the linear hyperplanes and their translations up by one. But in an arbitrary coxeter group, you actually just take the decomposition given by elementary inversion sets. So basically, you look at the elementary hyperplanes and the decomposition that uh, results from that. So yeah, the, the statement is that those automatons are the same exactly when those two partitions of W are the same. Okay. Yeah. Which is another way of saying is when this cone type partition is a hyperplane arrangement, in fact, as well. And there's another um, way of saying it. Mm -hmm. so, uh, hi. Um, this she type of partition that I didn't know the uh, what is that I mean can one find I say that again or, sir uh, I didn't know what, what this she type of partition is uh, oh yeah she you, she uh, um, for for our fine cox of the group she studied it um, back to with the intention of Kajdan Lustig um, cells in fact and for a n tilde or for a two tilde it's um, you look at the hot points through the origin and then you look at all of the ones shifted up by one. Uh -huh. okay. So that's just that. So that would be the identity chamber. And um, in fact, this picture I've drawn, um, the connected components in that picture is the decomposition of AN tilde into um, right Kajdan Lustig cells or left yep. cells, whichever way you're going around. And um, so that, that's just what he was looking at. But um, yeah. Yes, okay. yeah. Yeah, thanks for no worries. Do we have any further questions? Well, seems that probably not. So let's thank James one more time. Yeah, and let's see everyone hopefully soon. Thanks a lot. Thanks again for the invitation. Bye. Well, thank you, Sven and James, for your talks.